We continue with our discussion on convective mass transfer. So today is uh, 26th lecture, so I'm, I think, a little behind. So I will need about three lectures more to wind up the course, and then uh, that will make about 29 lectures. So the initially planned uh, you know, 12 to 13 tutorial, I'll try to squeeze them in about 11 tutorials so that we have 40 contact hours as per uh, the mandate. Uh, Yesterday, if you remember, in the last lecture, uh, we talked about uh, mass transfer between a solid and a fluid. And in that context, I had introduced uh, a mass transfer coefficient, uh, which was shown to be a, related to the effective concentration boundary layer uh, thickness. So it is uh, delta effective by D, uh, diffusion coefficient. So <clears throat> this parameter uh, is also uh, called uh, the boundary layer mass transfer coefficient. Why so? Uh, I'm going to explain a little right now. So we had the flux is equal to delta C and this is divided by the distance and the inverse of this parameter is the mass transfer coefficient. Um, okay, so this is is equal to K m inverse, which is conductance. Now, if you remember that we drawn a solid circle like this at x is equal to zero, and then this represents the concentration profile, and this is our bulk concentration. This is our surface concentration. And <clears throat> the process essentially uh, represents a surface reaction. So I, as I have written, in the solid phase going to I uh, in the dissolved state. Then the second step is we split it up into two different parts. One we say that transport through the boundary layer and then transport in the bulk. So the mass transfer step is isolated into two different parts because the resistance to mass transfer was small here because the velocity is small. So the resistance to mass transfer is large here, I'm sorry, because the velocity is small. So as a result of which, and that the bulk is well starred in most of the system, so one can assume that uh, you know the resistance is maximum here and possibly zero here, and that tells, you know, that allows us to make this hypothesis that as if this concentration prevails. So there is no difference in concentration. So there is, you know, it is moment instantaneous transport from this point to this point in essence because there is no difference between this concentration. So the largest drop in concentration or the only drop in concentration takes place within the boundary layer from this to this and thereafter there is no resistance that essentially means that your concentration difference must be equal. Okay, this concentration must be equal to this. So therefore, the three kinetic steps, we have assumed that the chemical reaction is fast. We have assumed that now uh, that there is no transport or the transport in the bulk phase is infinitely fast. So therefore, there is only one transport process which is rate limiting and that is the transport across the boundary layer and that is why the mass transfer coefficient thus deduced is termed as the boundary layer mass transfer coefficient. So in most of the solid liquid uh, reactions, we will find that it did, uh, it is the boundary layer resistance that provides the greatest resistance to the mass transfer process and hence the formulation that I have applied will continue to hold good. Now I continue with the discussion with respect to two fluids for example. So this is the scenario if you have two fluids for example, fluid 1 and fluid 2 and they are immiscible fluids suppose and an example could be a gas and a liquid. Okay. Suppose I you know, bubble uh, <coughs> nitrogen into water, okay. nitrogen does not have appreciated solubility in water. So therefore, this is fluid 1 or I can say that fluid 1 or liquid 1 is a slag and the liquid 2 uh, could be a metal and this is that is what is the representation here and this represents the interface. And if I have to explain the process further to exemplify, suppose this is slag 
and this is metal. And we think of a reaction like aluminium, which is dissolved in the metal, okay, this aluminium, and then there is silica in the slag, suppose, and this silica in the slag, they react with each other, and then they form Al2O3, aluminium oxide, because aluminium has a greater affinity towards oxygen, so we would expect that aluminium is will be able to, if it is a high temperature process, snatch that oxygen and in turn reduce the silica. So, how does this reaction really takes place? This reaction takes place because aluminium is there in the metal and the aluminium has to go to the interface. Silicon is there, silica is there, it has to come to the slag metal interface and this reaction is, is a heterogeneous reaction and this takes place not here, not here, but it takes place only at the interface and heterogeneous reactions as we all know, the rate of the heterogeneous reactions are proportional to the surface area of the interface because it is at the interface that the reaction takes place. On the other hand, in homogeneous reaction, the rate of reaction is proportional to the volume of the uh, reaction domain because heterogeneous homogeneous reactions takes place everywhere. So, silica transfers to the interface, dissolved aluminum transfers to the interface, both of them react, alumina is formed, the alumina, alumina now goes to the slag. So, there is a product migration in the and there is a silicon migration in the metal phase. So, there are four mass transfer steps involved in this particular reaction and halfway that is two after the two steps, once aluminum has gone there, silica has come here and then the chemical reaction, they, if they meet at the interface, then the chemical reaction can take place and then the product. So, therefore, if you look at this possibilities, the possibilities here could be that the chemical reaction could be rate limiting or mass transfer could be rate limiting. And if you say mass transfer is rate limiting, there could be one mass transfer step as rate limiting or the second you know number of mass transfer step as the rate limiting. And as I have indicated as a thumb rule, we will most of the time expect that mass transfer is rate limiting because this slag metal reactions etcetera basically takes place at high temperature and as a result of which we can expect that the rate of the chemical reaction is going to be significantly larger, it is going to be fast. So, the approach towards equilibrium state of equilibrium will be really rapid. So, given that if we now see that suppose we say that reactants are you know the product mass transports are not rate limiting. Okay? So, the slowest kinetic step, slowest step of the five steps that I have. So, we have a chemical reaction here which is sitting inside the circle say and the four errors represents the four mass transfer step. So, the overall rate of the process is a function of all these rates. They are all working in series mind it. So, their summation of the individual rates will give me the overall rates of the process, but if chemical reaction is equilibrium, in equilibrium, if the product transports are also really fast, in that case if we assume that only reactant transports to the interface are rate limiting, there are two rate limiting steps. In that case, we can simplify this scenario in terms of that there is, this is the concentration of silica and sorry, this I have written other way, bulk concentration is constant. So, this is, this is the concentration of silica and then similarly, we will expect that the concentration profile here. So, this is the typical characteristic curve like this that I have drawn here and we can imagine. So, this is concentration here in this on this side of the interface and this is the concentration on this side of the interface and this is silica profile and this is dissolved aluminum profile. If the product and the reactant are <coughs> if the uh, if the uh, products, transport of the product is not rate not rate limiting, only there is resistance in the process as far as the reactant concentrations are. So, this is just one possibility when I have assumed that on both sides of the interface, I have two set of boundary layers. One is this boundary layer and the other is this boundary layer. So, there are two boundary layers because there are two resistances in the whole process. The other case is that if you assume that look, 
I want to make it simplifi simplified that now I am saying that only one react of this only one is rate limiting. In that case, I will draw the aluminum concentration, alumina dissolved aluminum concentration because this is now the straight line. This is case 2 when the product uh, sorry the reactant silica in the slag the transport of transfer of silica from the slag to the interface is rate limiting but not the aluminum. So, there is no resistance here concentration everywhere is same that is what the concept I introduced here when I say that I can bring this concentration right up to here because I am assuming that within the bulk of the liquid, liquid the starting is good mixing is rapid. So, there is no essentially concentration difference. If there is no concentration difference there is no resistance. So, now the moment I assume that in the melt phase there is you know negligible resistance of aluminum transport. So, whatever is the concentration of aluminum here it reaches instantaneously at this. So, if I draw the graph like this one can look at the graph and then one can say that look, this is uh, basically the slack phase transport is the transport in the slack phase is the rate limiting or the slowest step. Already I have assumed that chemical reaction is in equilibrium product transfer rates are also very very fast. The first case I showed you with a curved line here are the situation in which I have two set of boundary layers on either side of the interface and now in the second case I assume that aluminum dissolved aluminum concentration is uniform here which means there is no melt phase resistance transport within the transport of reactant within the melt phase is not rate limiting and in that case I have a characteristic. If I say that chemical reaction is the rate limiting and transport processes are not rate limiting in that case you can expect that this line will also become straight. So, essentially in indicates that the concentration differential here and here are identical. So, there is no resistance here resistance to mass transfer here there is no resistance to mass transfer here and this is typically a profile which we will say in you know uh, uh, depict in the case of a chemical reaction control. But we do not want we are dealing with we are dealing with the subject of convective mass transfer. So, we do not want to call you know bring in that chemical reaction as rate limiting because that chemical kinetics is a different subject altogether. So, we are saying that now you know we can assume that we will work out the problem under the case that only one transport of the 4 or 3 or 5 whatever may be the transport processes only one of these are rate limiting that process could be melt phase control or slag phase control in a slag in a gas metal reaction that could be in the gas phase control or in the metal phase control. So, only one mass transfer steps is going to be considered we will consider it to be rate limiting and hence there is we will make it simple and ex postulate the existence of a boundary layer only on one side of <coughs> the interface. But what still it does not become a case similar to the one which I have you know discussed right in the beginning of the class because of the simple fact because this fluid motion there is motion at the interface is possible. At this case the, the interface is stagnant the layer of molecule or atom which is in contact with the solid you know remains perpetually in contact with the interface or within the solid. So, if the, the solid surface only sees this particular molecule okay, because of the prevalence of no slip boundary condition. But on the other hand what happens this if you have a molecule here okay, this molecule two molecules are not perpetually in contact because the interface itself has motion. So, therefore, the interface gets renewal and therefore, we can say that fresh and fresh material to the interface comes. So, this particular if you sit on this particular element I will see that well you know at this moment it is in contact with somebody or some molecule which has a very high concentration after some time it is in contact with some other molecule which is a very low concentration. So, it is exposed to a different kind of a scenario which is substantially different or entirely different from what I have depicted in the case of the solid liquid uh, mass transfer scenario. So, the surface we say this interface while it is fixed here in this case the interface has a capability to renew that means, new material can come into the interface and as a result of which uh, the mass transfer process can change. So, we now want to go into the de details of it. Now, if we have one thing we will know that if we consider slag metal we must understand that uh, 
one there are substantial amount of difference in the density of gas and liquid. The initial uh, the surface renewal theory. So, all that convective mass transfer uh, theories concerning two fluids are therefore termed as the surface renewal theory because of you know we allow not a you know the surface interface is not stagnant it is getting renewed as a function of time. So, therefore, on the while we say that this the convective solid liquid mass transfer is based on a boundary layer mass transfer theory on the other hand we will say the two fluid mass transfer is based on surface renewal theory which will allow for <coughs> movement of uh, you know species at the interface itself. Now, if we, if we imagine that you know when you have when you talk of two fluid mass transfers there are going to be substantially uh, difference when the initial theories were developed uh, gas particularly the gas metal reactions you can imagine that the gas viscosity and liquid viscosities are substantially uh, different. So, and we know that at the interface there has to be a continuity of shear stress because momentum is a conserved quantity ok. Just like the way we have heat flux continuity at the interface we will have a momentum flux continuity here and hence we can say that as far as taking a simplifying stand So, the velocity gradient these are the shear continuity of the shear stress expression at interface that is what is this ok. And now you understand that if the viscosities are largely different so will be the velocity gradients in the two. So, therefore, the material suppose if we say that this is my gas and this is my liquid ok. So, I can expect that the liquid viscosities are going to be substantially larger than the gas viscosity and as a result of which the velocity gradient in the liquid is going to be much much smaller than the velocity gradient because this is a small number multiplied by a large number and this is a large number multiplied by a small number ok. This essentially tells the continuity of shear stress dictates that the velocity gradient within the denser phase is going to be almost negligible or very very small. So, therefore, we can say velocity gradients are small mean ones with respect to the gas the solid the liquid has started to behave like a solid ok. So, from the gas if species is being transferred into the liquid we can per se approximate the scenario as if mass transfer is taking place from a fluid into a solid given that at the interface there has to be a continuity of uh, shear stress. So, one approximations that we can or the scientists who derive this concept we will discuss here Higby, Higby's model. So, that is the logic Higby provided when he was trying to address a uh, long time back in early you know mid 19, 1900 uh, address the mass transfer between solid and uh, liquid. This is a very popular subject in chemical engineering literature and there is extensive amount volume of uh, and this is basically uh, when there are large scale density difference between the two and the flow is laminar it is not a turbulent flow scenario and it is that condition that this discussion that I am going to present here is going to be applicable. So, one approximation is that in the dense surface the suppose if I say that I have a liquid surface here and then I have a gas here and from the gas something is getting absorbed into the liquid. So, the gas is seeing the liquid as if you know uh, it is a solid material because the velocity gradient within the liquid is going to be substantially smaller than the velocity gradient in the solid. Also we must understand that so therefore, this could be approximated as solid. Also we can understand because the, this is a surface renewal theory. So, we can we can assume that uh, the contact between the transferring species and the medium would be really short. It is not going to be a very long contact. So, so, so the, due, the, the process of mass transfer is uh, going to be really unsteady in nature. Now, the moment I say that look with respect to gas this becomes liquid 
this becomes solid uh, because of the criteria that I have discussed low velocity gradient or small velocity gradient this becomes solid. So, I can say that we know that if this can this is treated as a motionless media. So, the mechanism of mass transfer on this side of the interface is going to be diffusion okay? because this is being treated with respect to the gas as a solid that is what was done by Higby. So, that is one approximation first is considering the liquid with respect to the gas as a solid and then saying that look the mechanism of mass transport within the solid is diffusion. So, the theories of diffusion will apply. Now, since you can imagine that they, this uh, solid which is in contact with the liquid. So, a given element the mass transfer really takes place here and this, this does not perpetually sit on this particular element. So, this will come and then this will go away because there is a finite amount of motion here. So, as a result of which what happens is that we can expect that the mass transfer is going to be unsteady state in nature if you consider a small little volume elements. So, the duration of mass transfer duration of diffusion is going to be extremely small because the surface is continuously in motion with respect to each other. If the surfaces are in contact the duration is large it is actually infinite duration that is what their mass transfer is going to be taking place between the layers. So, with this atom and this surface you know the contact time is infinite, but imagine this molecule which is undergoing motion. So, therefore, we can say that fresh and fresh material is coming in to the system. So, the contact time the time at which we call it as an exposure time. This molecule will come and sit on the surface at a given location for some time diffusion will take place and then the atom is going to or the molecule is going to go away. So, the con number one is that the diffusion domain behaves like a solid. Number two is diffusion is the mechanism therefore, is an approximate mechanism or predominant mechanism of mass transfer here. The diffusion is unsteady and if the contact time is extremely short as I am saying in that case what happens we can inf we can imagine no matter what is the size of the or the volume of the diffusion the diffusing species sees the domain as a semi infinite domain because the contact time is small and within that short time it can only penetrate a little bit distance. So, no matter whether the other boundary is here or here or there it is not able to see the far end of the boundary and therefore, the semi infinite approximation will hold good subject to the condition that I have already mentioned. So, I reiterate again it is a solid domain that is what we are going to treat it is a diffusion mechanism it is an unsteady state diffusion and because the contact time is short as I have explained we can diffusion domain can be treated as a semi infinite domain. If that is so then we have the concept of unsteady state diffusion that we have already done okay, in the semi infinite media will apply and there we have seen that the time average flux is given if you remember in terms of C s star minus C b okay, multiplied by 2 and this is the expression that I have derived on the basis of the error function solution because given that 4 criteria that I have just now mentioned. Okay. This essentially implies that the diffusion equation in the semi infinite medium will give me and this solution this is that because the chemical reaction is rate limiting not rate limiting. So, therefore, the surface concentration will be known to us it is going to be fixed for all time okay. and therefore, this is the time average flux and time averaging is T e and in this particular case T e essentially represents the contact time or the exposure time. Okay. So, within that contact time the short time there is the element comes. So, I would now depict this could be something like this. So, so you can see that the mass transfer takes place we have an element here okay. that element comes at the interface it sits here it travels with the solid and then it ejects that is what is. So, the mass transfer takes place from the liquid to the gas and this element. Okay. So, from here to here this is the time at for which the mass transfer is really taking place and this time 
which is sort of a dwell time or sitting time is termed as the exposure time and it is for this duration that we calculate the average mass transfer uh, rate or the average mass flux itself and this we have already derived. Okay? And we say that <coughs> this is actually and then we have this is according to our process this is the mass transfer coefficient the flux this is equal to C S star minus C B and this tells us that K M the mass transfer coefficient in this case is going to be 2 times D by pi D. In steady state diffusion one characteristic is that that if you, if you look at uh, because this is a this exposure time which is given here and I have explained it. So, therefore, the estimation d is, d is the diffusion coefficient which is going to which is known to us given the temperature and pressure and therefore, the estimation of k m the mass transfer coefficient will solely depend on the exposure time. If you know the exposure time you can calculate the mass transfer coefficient if you know the mass transfer coefficient you should be able to calculate the flux. Now, we see here that one of the characteristics of the surface renewal theory is that flux is proportional to square root of d. On the other hand, we have seen from Fourier's law that flux is proportional to d, okay? d, d and into concentration gradient. So, that was the Fourier's law, sorry, uh, Fick's law. But the flux is proportional to d, but in the case of surface renewal theory what we see that always we will see this dependence that the mass transfer coefficient uh, you know or the flux is going to be proportional to d to the power half. Similarly, if you do <coughs> km okay, the mass transfer coefficient the same square root d dependence comes into the picture, but in the case of here for example, we will see that the mass transfer coefficient is inversely proportional Km, as I have indicated earlier, is equal to <coughs> so d by delta effective. That's what it is, and it is directly proportional to d. But in the case of surface renewal theory, it is proportional to. That is the only difference, and that we must remember. So if you look at a paper or in you know, a discussion and you see that a diffusion coefficient or a, a flux or a mass transfer coefficient proportional to d to the power half has been applied. So, you can say that you know people some of the writer is considering uh, you know a surface renewal theory rather than a boundary layer theory which tells us that mass transfer coefficient is proportional to d. Now, let us see the application of this okay, in the context in which it be applied. So, because the, once you know the mass transfer coefficient, the flux can be very well calculated. Suppose you have a small bubble, spherical bubble, whose size is taken to be constant and it is rising with a terminal velocity ut. And this may be a gas and the surrounding may be a liquid. As the gas bubble is rising, this is Higby's, Higby's experiment as the gas bubble is rising with the terminal velocity, it is dissolving. Of course, as it dissolves, the diameter, etc., changes. Okay? There are fluid pressures acting on it. It may not be purely spherical, but consider that it is rising with the terminal velocity, it is behaving, maintaining its rigid shape, okay, or you know, a spherical shape, and that its size is not undergoing again that assumption will be valid if we say that the dissolution of the gas is really slow. The solubility of the gas is not so pretty. This will not be good if you are using something like carbon dioxide because carbon dioxide would be highly dissolving in water which is the surrounding bulk fluid. So, therefore, if you look at the exposure time here, the exposure time will be given in terms of the terminal rise velocity the diameter of the bubble. This is. So, as the bubble rises up, okay, so you can imagine that this part comes here 
and that's what happens when you know the bubble has moved through a distance about the e so therefore the mass transfer coefficient can now <coughs> be given as 2 times square root d by pi into t e so which essentially becomes uh, d times this is t e and t e is equal to this so therefore you can say u t by d b and 2 by square root pi and then you can say this is u t by d b into we can say this is square root of t and 2 by square root of pi is, is equal to so let us go from here this is equal to so mass transfer coefficient is, is equal to 1.13 that's what is 2 by square root of pi and we have I can write it as ut by dv raised to the power half into d raised to the power half. If you multiply this km into db, I want to bring in the dimensionless groups into the picture. So, I multiply db and divide it by the diffusion coefficient and same thing if I do here, then whatever I am going to get here is that this will be is equal to ut into db raised to the power half and this is going to be 1 by d to the power half. And if I now put in nu here and if I put in nu here the kinematic viscosity then what I get basically is 1.13 into Reynolds which is diameter based Reynolds number raised to the power half and this is the Spitz number raised to the power half and we can say 1.13 into Peclet number raised to the power half in which the mass transfer Peclet number is, is equal to Reynolds number multiplied by the Spitz number. We have the heat transfer Peclet number also then we will get is applicable to force convection and we are going to get then Reynolds number multiplied by the Prandtl number and this is the correlation based on which uh, the analysis gas liquid mass transfer was analyzed for the first time you know uh, as early as in the mid during the middle of 19th century <coughs> 19th century the Higbee's model can also be applied in very many interesting situations and one such scenario is we have say we have an inductively starred bath that is how induction inductively starred baths are represented because there are coils there so the moment you take a slice the coils look like hollow spheres uh, hollow circles so therefore if you have an inductively starred bath and this is the central line the flow is like this. So, if a gas phase here many times in metals for example uh, aluminum etc magnesium is added as an inoculant inoculant means you know that you want to uh, this will dissolve and then during the solidification process these inoculants are going to facilitate nucleation at multiple uh, sizes multiple sites. So, magnesium is added to the melt and what happens is this magnesium has a high vapor pressure. So, the magnesium whatever you add the magnesium tends to be lost from the melt to the or alternatively you can pose the problem that you take a melt which contains magnesium because magnesium has high vapor pressure. So, magnesium has an inherent tendency to go from here to the gas phase. Now, if you postulate now that look there is a resistance here and we have a bulk concentration and this bulk concentration is going to change 
and we have so that is the kind of a concentration that is going to the mixing is going to be much rapid here so the boundary layer existence is on this side this is the surface concentration and this is the bulk concentration and now the bulk concentration is higher than the surface concentration that's how it is going whatever magnesium is reaching the surface magnesium in the dissolved state reaching the surface is becoming magnesium gas phase so at this interface the concentration of magnesium must be smaller than here and that's how that is the driving force that's how so this value you can assume you can look at this is this is the axis of concentration. So, this concentration is smaller than this concentration. So, this is bulk concentration which is changing as a function of time. And the moment the magnesium reaches here, then what happens? The magnesium is evaporated from the system. So, whether you add magnesium or magnesium exists in the melt, okay? if you hit it, then there is going to be a progressive decay of magnesium with respect to the initial concentration. If you want to find it out that at what rate magnesium is going to be going out of the same melt in that case you should you can one can apply if the stirring is not too rapid if the start if you assume that there is a laminar flow and this represents the radius of the vessel and suppose you say that i know the velocity okay at the surface velocity which is suppose v where from v could be known the v could be known from visual observation and then 2r by v essentially will represent sorry is r by v. So, r by v will represent this is a linear distance, this is the velocity, this will represent the time scale. So, that means we can assume that an element will come stay here and then the element will go away. So, the contact time is dictated by the radius of the vessel and the velocity and this velocity is known and therefore, the mass transfer coefficient can be given in terms of as I said 2 into square root of d divided by pi into T e which is, is equal to <coughs> R into v. and this parameter is all known to us the moment we know that. Now, the mass transfer coefficient in the melt. So, the rate limiting step here is it is the mass melt phase transport controlled process and the transport of magnesium across the boundary layer in the melt phase is the rate limiting kinetic step. Okay? And now, we can say that we can write down that look k m the mass transfer coefficient huh, times the concentration difference so switch which is C b and this C b is not constant this C b is changing as magnesium is escaping from the surface itself. So, you can say C b minus C at surface, but this parameter as I have indicated to you is 0 because whatever magnesium reaches the chemical reaction is very very fast it is instantaneously converted into magnesium gas and as a result of which we can say this is the rate and this must be is equal to loss of magnesium this is the rate at which magnesium is going to the gas and whatever I am writing on the left hand side is the rate at which magnesium is lost and I have to multiply to with the area and that area essentially represents the exposed surface area. So, this also becomes kg per meter cube and this also becomes kg per meter cube where V represents the volume of the metal contained within the vessel itself. And if you now look at this term, so you get dCb, so rate of change of concentration o <coughs> over Cb and then we have minus a times k m divided by volume into t t. Subject to the condition that at t is equal to 0, C b is equal to C b i, the initial concentration of magnesium before loss has started to place. So, if I am melting, it is a melting experiment. So, whatever is the magnesium content of the solid that is to be taken as C b with a suffix is equal to i and if you integrate and apply this limit then we get C b over C b i this is equal to exponential 
minus k m a you will write it as small k huh? I am writing I think small k is the notation k m into v <coughs> that is the final expression. So, we can find out if we know this because k m is known mass transfer coefficient we have calculated based on this particular formulation. So, we should be able to calculate that how does the concentration changes as a function of time. So, C b over C b i if we plot it as a function of t and the slope of this will give us a measure of what is this known? This total product k m is the meters per second this is meter square. So, this becomes meter cube per second and this is volume this is meter cube. So, this has a dimension of 1 by second and that is what this is called this is the rate constant. For the boundary layer melt phase transport controlled process. So, that rate constant can be determined if you if you measure the bulk concentration as a function of keep on measuring monitoring the bulk concentration as a function of time ok. The concentration not here not here, but if you measure the concentration from here or here or here and then plot this concentration ratio C b over C b i as a function of t then the slope of the line will give you the rate constant that is how the rate constant is determined. And then you can check whether the rate constant yields the mass transfer coefficient that agrees with the Higbee's model or not and this will allow you to conclude that whether Higbee's model is applicable even to such kind of a scenario or not. So, there are many limiting that I have discussed with respect to a spherical bubble. We can take a spherical cap bubble the geometry becomes now uh, because it is a uh, you know portion of a sphere. So, the spherical cap bubble looks like this. So, you have to do a little bit of solid geometry in order to find out that what is this particular length given the bubble diameter etcetera. So, this is actually the sphere and this is the center of the sphere and if this is the spherical cap bubble and it is rising with a terminal velocity then the same philosophy can be applied and the mass transfer coefficient can be calculated ok and then you can find out that what is the rate of transport <coughs> from the gas to the liquid. Now, if you have turbulent flows for example, most of the time what happens in industries we see turbulent flows. So, these simple exercises the Higbee's model are mostly untenable and there what happens is we have Dankworth's model which is applicable to turbulent flows. And Dankworth's model says that the mass transfer coefficient is equal to diffusion coefficient into s raised to the power half. This s parameter is known as the surface renewal factor. And this has a dimension of 1 by second. So, meter square per second 1 by second. So, we get square root of it we get meters per second and that is exactly the dimension of the mass transfer coefficient. Again the characteristics of d to the power half comes out here because it is a surface renewal theory. Dunkward's model is also based on surface renewal concept. So, therefore, that characteristics of. Now, the surface renewal factor is a uh, parameter which is difficult to determine from theoretically, but the mass transfer coefficient in turbulent flows uh, can be determined or can be estimated from what is known as low small eddy theory and large eddy theories. These are not of course, within the scope of the course, but I can write down the expre expression and then show you what it essentially implies. So, in order to calculate mass transfer coefficient you will require a surface renewal factor, but this surface renewal factor is a parameter which is to be determined alternatively or you can say you can find out the mass transfer coefficient through a relevant theory and then determine that what is the surface renewal factor for the given process. And as I said that it Dunkworth's model is applicable to turbulent flow. So, therefore, we will see, you know there are two possibilities there are many possibilities actually two theories are very popular one is called a small eddy theory and the other is called a large eddy theory. 
sufficient to note for you that when the bigger eddies, larger size eddies control the mass transfer process, the large eddy theory is applicable. On the other hand, when small eddy theory, small eddies are controlling uh, the mass transfer, okay. So, this scenario possibly is going to be closer to the laminar flow, this is far away from the laminar flow. So, small eddies basically if the mass transfer is taking place between the wall near the solid wall or so, the small eddy theory is going to be applicable. And in this case, the mass transfer coefficient is given in terms of and then d to the power half into epsilon divided by u raised to the power 0 0.25. That is what is the expression. The derivation etcetera is not within the scope of it. So, this is d to the power half and this represents uh, the energy dissipation. So, this could be suppose you know we are, we are the starting energy this could be proportional to the starting energy or a measure of the starting energy and this represents the kinematic viscosity of the fluid. On the other hand if we have large eddy theory then also you can have uh, something like I think it is. where u represents a characteristic velocity which could be a mean speed of liquid recirculation in the system integrated average of okay this cannot be velocities this is speed and this could be a characteristic length scale in the process itself and this d is the diffusion coefficient so this will this can provide us the estimates of you know the mass transfer coefficient but really this is not the issue the issue why I have discussed this is that the interfacial area which is needed to estimate the mass transfer rate. So, you have seen that I have written the expression and I have area okay, and that area I have is for example, in the case of a bubble you know we can take that it is the total surface area 4 pi r square of the bubble through which the mass transfer takes place. Now, similarly in the induction furnace problem it is the exposed area of the top circle pi r 0 square that could be taken as the interfacial area across which the mass transfer is taking place. But imagine for example, in the industrial process because it is turbulent flow when you have slag and metal which are mixed together, okay, you can have many tiny droplets of slag and we know that the net rate of transport is given in terms of the area multiplied by mass transfer coefficient and times the concentration gradient. So, while the mass transfer coefficient can be obtained either from this or this in turbulent flow, delta C or the changes in concentration can be obtained on the basis of application of equilibrium uh, reactions at the interface, the estimation of area is going to be very difficult. I, you know the slag and metal for example, in industries are going to be when the reactors are extensively mis mixed, they are going to be totally mixed where the slag droplets are going to be distributed in the domain. And when slag droplets are going to be distributed, it is not the planar area which you can consider. For example, you can imagine steel making furnaces like LD converter where you have slag multiple number of droplets of different sizes etcetera are generated. How do you calculate this interfacial area that brings in the greatest uncertainty for the application of the theory to actual process. Similarly, if you are injecting gas bubbles, for example, when you drain molten metal, I will just take 5 more minutes and then wind up. Suppose if you have a metal container and then you are emptying a furnace, the molten metal comes here. Okay, from one furnace, you are emptying one furnace into another vessel. So, this is the furnace stream from furnace and this is say my little. As the stream is exposed to the surrounding, it drags along with. So, this is the downward and this is the interface and as the air and train, we can expect that there is going to be a large number of air bubbles dispersed in the system. This is the same scenario when you open a tap over a bucket. So, you see that there are a lot of or you know you can see for example, when you fill up a bottle in an aqua guard machine for example, you can see that the stream that thin stream is also 
going to be entraining some tiny bubbles which may be 10 or 12 in number. But in this case, you know, when the metal form, metal flow at 10 tons per minute in a huge reactor, you can imagine how many bubbles are going to be generated and you know, what size range of the bubbles are going to be generated and what would be the total gas liquid interfacial area which would be needed in order to compute the mass transfer rates between the gas and the liquid. So, this poses the biggest challenge to us that is really how accurately we can calculate. So, we can calculate the mass transfer coefficients accurately on the basis of either application of the small eddy theory or large eddy theory. We can use the overall mass balance equation, but as far as the calculation or knowledge of interfacial area is concerned, we are in big problem still and in most of the processes of industrial relevance, we are not in a position to find out for example, the precise interfacial area between the two phases across which the mass transfer uh, takes place. So, with this I will conclude today's lecture and now we will discuss uh, for the next two, three lectures that what are the application of diffusion convection as well as uh, fluid convection or two fluid convection uh, you know uh, applications, applications of these theories that we have learned so far. And I want to do several cases starting with uh, solid state uh, carburization that essentially will tell you the diffusion process. Also gas phase, uh, gas carburization process, maybe nitriding process, this will be basically uh, the application of diffusive mass transfer. In convective mass transfer, we will talk about uh, dissolution of solids and leaching of solids in aqueous medium or in an alkaline medium and as far as uh, the two fluid mass transfer is concerned, we will talk about the dissolution of gases. Particularly this example we are going to take that how air is get, gets into and trained into steel and how really uh, uh, air gets or oxygen and nitrogen gets dissolved in the molten metal. So, four or five cases I am going to address and I am going to demonstrate uh, that you know through those examples uh, how the theories that we have learned so far uh, can be applied to the analysis of critical problems.